This chapter of our AIS textbook talks about controls for information security. So we've talked about security quite a bit already in the class, and just it seems to be a persistent problem coming around IT. And it hits all different kinds of organizations, whether you're a small firm and you get hit with a ransomware attack, or you're at and and you lose virtually all your customer information. It's just a common problem that we have to deal with these days. So this chapter is going to talk about some of the different elements that you should be aware of, and then try to make it practical by talking about your personal IT security. All right, so there is some larger stuff we're not going to really hit too hard in this. Um, I think some of these things are better understood after you've been out there in the work world for a while. So we're going to try and focus on a couple of key pieces, like the security fundamental concepts, and then some practical controls. We're going to do less on the trust service framework element. We're talking about some of the controls that we can use to detect issues and then talk about how to respond to this as well. All right, so the trust service framework, these are terms you should be familiar with. You know the difference between security versus confidentiality or privacy and integrity. Uh, they're all different aspects, um, but again, I think this is best thought of as a larger management issue. And you can kind of look at these together and the, the book kind of puts them together in this house-like structure talking about how security is kind of the basic piece and we build stuff on top of that. I would like to view it though more from the perspective of security is a management issue, not a technical issue. We could completely lock down our entire environment and be 100% safe just by turning off the internet, you know, doing just the minimal stuff or heck even throwing away computers entirely. Security problems generally come because we want to be open, we want to let the people do things because they gotta get their job done. You can't block off the internet from an employee that needs it to do their job. So really it comes down to a management issue and a set of trade-offs. We can kind of balance the idea of security against the idea of being able to be productive and have access and try things out or experiment. Really we look at this and people are gonna be the weakest link inside your organization. They're easier to fool than the technology is. And a lot of the technology problems we run into are actually the result of someone getting confused or someone making a mistake. So as a kind of a key example here, we have the standard phishing attempts that people probably you're receiving these days, where someone sends you a text message pretending to be someone like UPS. And we'll talk in class about some elements of this, like how can you detect when these are obviously fake, um, but generally you should have an attitude of distrust. You should not trust that anyone that sends you a link or a message is who they say that they are. And there's a lot of ways that this can be kind of tricked with, um, but if you have the attitude of don't trust anyone who initiates contact with you, it will probably put you in pretty good stead. We also see issues over email, and a lot of these are hitting things like Bitcoin. And you don't want to be the person in your company who clicked on the link or downloaded the bad file and then got your company all messed up because of that as a result. So again, you need to have this attitude of skepticism whenever you see a message coming in. All right, we're gonna get back a couple of those and talk about them in class. So how can you mitigate risks of here? Uh, well, there's a bunch of controls. One of them is physical, right? When you think about your modern organization, you want to keep your servers isolated in a different room. You want to think about how you can help your employees lock their devices down. And that might be that the hard drives are automatically encrypted. Uh, it could be that they're all up to date and managed. I think one of the problems we have is so many people work from home nowadays and they want to use their own personal computers. Well, IT doesn't have control over those computers. We don't know if they're up to date, if they've got spyware on them, um, all kinds of things. So you'll find when you move from being a student into being an employee that probably you're gonna have more hoops to jump through. And that's a good thing. And we want to make sure that your computers are safe and secure. We have a lot of detective controls. Now, one of the things you'll find out with IT vulnerabilities is often once people get these, these uh, inroads into your organization, they're going to try and sit on them for a while. They're going to try and keep that going for as long as possible. And so we, it's really important that your organization does things to figure out if you have been breached because no one's going to tell you if they don't have to. This could be from log analysis, from intrusion detection systems. We've been having these things called honeypots. Honeypots are deliberately vulnerable systems. And you set them up, you have juicy stuff like you know, payroll processing or physical account or Bitcoin saving system. 
And then you see if anyone contacts them and tries to get in. And that'll tell you if someone's in your organization. All of these, though, should have some kind of continuous monitoring component. And that means there's some system out there that's just looking to see if there's any problems with your organization. Then you also need response. How do you deal with this after you find something? So you generally, most organizations have special teams that focus on this, but you might find yourself coming up against these or being asked to be part of these as well as some kind of response team, and often organizations have a chief security officer. So let's look at some of these in more detail. So physical, right? One of the most basic ideas is to limit entry to your building. The more people that can come in, the more likely you are to have risks. And as an example, think about our building here at WVU. There's no one at the door checking people's student IDs. So anyone who wants to could just simply walk into the building and plug their computer into something. So most organizations have some level of restricted access to their network and data. Here's an example of a server room. So you'll find these scattered throughout your organization. Usually each building has its own server room. And the idea is you have a special place with redundant power, with redundant air conditioning that can house your system's servers. You also find issues coming around printers. So most organizations have some kind of managed printing interface or managed printing structure where you try to centralize this. And one of the reasons you want to do this is because having all these random laser jets or other desktop printers around your organization can be a way people can come in and attack your organization. Often these are not secured very well and they're not updated very well by the manufacturer. And so someone can come in and drive by a building, scan for any vulnerable HP printers, and then get a breach into that printer. Once they get access to a printer, they'll try and take that and hop into the next step, which could be a server or someone's computer. So we think about preventative processes. A key thing is user access controls. So authentication is verifying that someone is who they say they are. And we can use a combination of these. So think about your iPhone. Uh, something the per person knows, that could be your code for your phone, you know, one, two, three, four, five. It could be something that you have, like some places use physical keys, or imagine your car key, right? That's a physical key use. It could be biometric, that could be your face scanning, or it could be your thumb, or some combination of all of those things. So authentication, this is Duo, essentially. We want to make sure you are who you say you are, and generally you want to combine two of these together to make sure that it's more secure. Authorization then says, once we know who you are, what do you get access to? And this could be rights to certain folders, to certain classes in eCampus, your personal information, advisor information, all that kind of stuff. So as an example of a physical key, you have this Yubi keys that you might have heard of before, or this one here, Okta. Um, but these are physical tokens you can use to increase your level of security as well. Uh, Google now offers some of this kind of thing, especially for people who are high-risk targets, for example, journalists. And for you, your company might do similar things. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because auditors get access to a lot of privileged information. And so that makes you a target. Uh, if you have someone who has been an auditor of HP, you might find someone from IBM would love to know information about what HP is doing and what their market looks like. You might also find that people would try and get into auditors to get early access to earnings information. For example, if I can log in, find someone's earning for the next quarter, I can go ahead and short the stock or put a bid in on it. You often will have these things called access control matrices. So these are ways of tracking who gets access to different systems. And so as a simple table, you might have that Bob gets a file share uh, for accounting and production, but not QuickBooks. This is also something that you'll use to go in and audit an organization's IT security. You want to find out who's got access to different parts and different systems. In poorly run organizations, what you'll find is that everyone's got access to everything. And that's challenging because it means that you can't really tell what went wrong when something happens. Other IT preventative controls, we have anti-malware. And this could be something like a Norton antivirus or Windows Defender. You might find there's access controls on the network, for example, making people log in with Duo before they get access. Uh, device and software hardening is typically something like encryption. And these are things so that someone can't grab the hard drive out of your computer and read the files that are on it. And that way, if so you lose your computer, someone steals it, it minimizes the damage to the organization. 
A firewall is another classic example of a preventative control. A firewall is basically a piece of computer equipment that sits between the public internet and your own particular infrastructure for your company. You might have that, for example, like a main firewall, or you might have one for each department as well. And the idea here is something called defense in depth. The idea is that people will breach your network security, and so you want to have as many different levels as possible. So someone from sales has no reason to go into payroll. Someone from finance has no reason to go into sales. So we're trying to minimize the damage when inevitably someone does break in. One of the things you can do with these firewalls or other intrusion detection systems is actually look at what people are saying inside of a network. So we call these things packets, and often we call these packet filters. So the idea is we take a file, we break it into multiple pieces, and then we send it over our network. You can see this in software. For example, there's one called Wireshark that shows things that are actually going over the air in a Wi-Fi network. And we can see people talking to each other in here. We can see different messages being sent. And obviously, it's super technical and kind of hard to read. But that's why we have these intrusion detection systems. These IDS systems will look at what's happening over a network and record it. And then they're going to compare it to other things. And so say, hey, you know what? I'm, not, I'm seeing new traffic between these two people that I know is, indicates some sort of problem. So I'm going to raise up an alert to my network administrator. So again, this is log analysis and IDS. So we'll do an example in class, but you can open up on your computer a software called Activity Monitor if you're a Mac, or Task Manager for PC. And you can see all the different softwares that are running on your computer. And what you'll find is that there's a ton of stuff happening there that you just don't know about. And that's why we need these systems, because there's a lot of bad stuff out there that will hide among the good stuff. We talked about Honey Pops already. This is a decoy system and then continuous monitoring. We want to make sure that we're keeping track of what's happening. Continuous monitoring could even be something as, as complex as something that reads all of the emails coming out of your organization. And what they're looking for is people who are sending things that they shouldn't send. For example, social security numbers. It's easy to get an employee to take an Excel file and shoot it to their personal email that has a whole bunch of, con of sensitive information. And so a good IDS, or a good intrusion, or continuous monitoring system, will track that. And if it finds anyone sending socials through their email, it'll stop it and then notify someone. So one thing we often do in large organizations is what's called the penetration test. Penetration tests are when you hire a company to try and break into your organization. And the idea here is that they're likely to find holes and problems that you're not aware of. We also want to make sure that we are in control of our network. So you make sure that networks have change management processes so that no one just randomly grabs things and throws them on the internet, uh, but instead we kind of think about risks carefully before doing something new. And one example of a change management process can be found in this little diagram here. Someone makes a request for a change. We look to see what impact it'll have in the business, approved and denied, implementation, and then review reporting. What we're getting at here with a lot of this stuff is just the need to manage your IT in a professional way. This requires resources, which means money for equipment and money for people. But what we're getting at the idea here is at a certain point, it's just too risky not to have a test environment. Everyone's testing with making changes and modifications, but some people when are, that are better run will have a whole test environment set up that's separate from your production environment. Nowadays, we see a lot of interest in virtualization and cloud computing. Virtualization is a way of moving equipment off of our own um, servers and onto a cloud. And again, I'm going to oversimplify this uh, just to kind of keep it at a high level for you all. But cloud computing means that instead of buying equipment myself and running things on my own servers, I instead have Amazon or Google run them for me. Virtualization is a process where I take a physical computer and turn it into just software. And the idea is I can take one or two or 10 PCs that are running separately or servers that are running separately in my server room and put them into a single cloud by turning them into software. 
And then Amazon can kind of decide how they want to run those virtual computers. They can run you know, one to one, meaning one physical computer runs one virtual computer, or they can double up or triple up. So you have four or five virtual machines running on one physical server. But we're trying to get the idea of being more efficient with how we use physical computers in our server rooms. Nowadays, we often see a lot of issues as well with the internet of things. So you might have things, things like uh, ring uh, doorbells. You might have you know, Wi-Fi enabled uh, thermostats, or you might have Wi-Fi. Actually, I have a Wi-Fi enabled cat feeder, which is kind of funny. Um, but the idea is that these have all these, these things that connect to your Wi-Fi network. But a lot of them use fairly old, non-updated software packages. And so they open up risk possibilities. So even early on, you know, this is you know, almost 10 years ago, we had a bunch of light bulbs start flashing SOS because they used an old copy of some software. People found a vulnerability and they're able to remotely hack them. And this happens more recently as well. Uh, we can see some done with Alexa and Google Assistant that were vulnerable as well. But again, this is something you need to think about as you add these smart devices to your network is that they do introduce risks and vulnerabilities. And so one thing you want to do is talk to your IT department about how they're being isolated through things like firewalls or virtual networks uh, as a way of keeping them isolated from the more sensitive parts of your organization. I think one of the key things here is just to keep your personal gear up to date. We're constantly finding new vulnerabilities in computer equipment and software. And so it's really critical not to run old stuff. This means that you're on the latest copy of Windows or Mac. This means that when your phone tells you it has an update, you go ahead and apply it and reboot. Um, it is, I know it's annoying to update stuff, but it's important to kind of stay on this train as technology changes. All right, there's a lot of terminology for this class uh, in this chapter. I don't think you need to know all of it, but try and pay attention to the ones we specifically mentioned inside of this lecture here. But hopefully this was a good overview of computer security and some of the issues that we see inside of computer security today in IT. You don't have to become an expert in it, but you should be familiar with some of the high-level concepts and some of the more significant risk patterns.